Hello chap here, welcome to the workshop for part two of my little series about French rifled muskets. So the first episode I introduced you to this uh, Imperial Guard Voltigeur rifle of 1854 and now I want to take a more general view as to the instruction of soldiers with these newfangled rifled muskets. And one of the positive outcomes of the Crimean War was that the French generals finally acknowledged that it was a very good idea to have rifled muskets for all the infantry. But that also means that you need to train the infantry to use it effectively. You have to remember at the time France is a conscript-based army, so the standing army is very small, and in terms when a campaign comes along, it expands massively with citizen soldiers. So this imposes a certain amount of uh, limitations on the amount of training that can be given, the quality, the time, and also let's not forget the expense of all the training. So I'm going to try and uh, point out the salient points of the uh, the yearly musketry practice that uh, a citizen soldier would go through, be it uh, a new recruit, a new conscript, or someone that's going through the repetition, the yearly repetition. And for this I am uh, going through this document, Instruction sur le tir du fusil rayé d'infanterie et du mousqueton rayé de gendarmerie. This was published on the 17th of November 1870, sorry, 1860, and it is free on Gallica, which is uh, the French National Library website, if you want to have a, a read in detail. The bullet used at the time was uh, no longer this uh, 1854 projectile, but uh, a bigger minier, the 1857 pattern, and that was for general use. There was no longer one pattern of bullet for or rifles, muskets, and uh, carbines in the infantry. Riflemen, chasseurs are a different story. And the uh, new recruits and the uh, old hands were all given the same repetition, just that some of the modules were a bit shorter for those with more experience. So before they even touched a cartridge, they would, of course, have either uh, been shown how to handle the rifle or have a repetition, quick refresher, they would also get extensive lessons on how to aim, and uh, this would be with the rifle empty, they would have a stopper so they could drive fire, then they would uh, repeat everything just with musket caps, then they would have blank cartridges, and finally they would be able to have some live fire. Now this document contains a very interesting exercise about how to uh, train your trigger pull. Uh, already back in the day it was it was noticed that, uh, well, it was acknowledged that this was one of the essential requirements to precision. So rather than uh, dryly talk to you, let's have a little bit of a demonstration. First of all, we need a candle. I'll we'll shove that in the vise. There you are. Then we need to place the musket at one ramrod's length from the candle, well, the muzzle. I'm going to have to do this diagonally because it's uh, so long. Okay. We need one musket cap. Then we place the muzzle at the end, level with the end of the ramrod and aim it below the flame, slowly raise it, and when the foresight is level with the top of the wick, more or less, there you can press the trigger. All right, okay, here it goes. All right, there we go. So. Theory was that if you lined up properly and had a smooth trigger pull, the flame will go out. This was an exercise that was simply done in the barrack rooms, and this would be done in uh, two sessions of five caps each. Uh, you would have three goes standing and two goes kneeling. A lot of time and effort is also put into training the soldiers in the estimation of distance. Uh, this was up to 600 meters, and which was the maximum distance the infantry were shooting at, by the way, and this could be done simply by measuring or pacing, 
um, but also using observation or tricks because it was recognized that as distance increased, certain features of the uniform of a soldier or a cavalryman would, would disappear, couldn't be distinguished from the mass. And so by repetition, they would learn, um, basically you can't in identify facial features at a certain distance or the bayonet can't be distinguished and so on. You have to think that because it's a conscript army in the ranks, you could have a mass teacher, a you know, farmhand and a cabinet maker shoulder to shoulder, they all have vastly different levels of education and you've got to train them all to be able to appreciate these distances. So it wasn't an easy task. Anyway, probably what you're most interested in is uh, how firing with live cartridges was done. So before we actually go through the exercises, a couple of interesting points I want to point out. Uh, first of all, firing was done at 100, 200, 400 and 600 meters. Uh, firing was always done with the bayonet mounted. You could perfectly fine to shoot with two fingers. In fact, apparently it was also encouraged. During the loading sequence, the cap is placed on the nipple prior to loading the barrel, which is exactly like you would do on a flintlock. The hammer is then gently lowered fully onto the cap. And um, this actually makes sense. It's far easier to do that than try and catch the half cock notch, especially in a hurry. Um, you have to remember that contrary to uh, flint locks, where the half cock allows you to access the priming pan for priming, on a percussion lock, the half cock just raises the hammer ever so slightly and you can't reach the nipple. Um, in fact, the, uh, the half cock notch on a percussion rifle is more to be able to carry the rifle around with the, uh, the chamber loaded and the cap on the nipple because you don't want to carry it full cock, obviously. And uh, if you carry it hammered down, a knock or a bump could set the primer off. So the only, um, the only safe way to do it within the stands of the day was to just raise the hammer so that it securely engaged the half cock notch. So the target that they're aiming at is a, uh, a frame on which is mounted a paper target. It is two meters high by 50 centimeters wide, which is more or less a human silhouette. You know, a soldier with shako, of course, is about two meters high. Uh, in the middle, about belt height is a black spot, 20 centimeters in diameter, and that is simply an aiming mark. It, uh, it's, not, no, the, it's not the bull so to speak. Um, at 100 meters, they use a single target. 200 meters, they put two targets together. At 400, four targets together. And at 600, we have eight targets together. The ballistic curve for the 1857 projectile is well established, and there's a separate curve for full length rifles and for the shorter musketoons. Um, and to keep things simple, they noticed that between 0 and 200 meters, the deviation from the aiming line, it's such that if you keep aiming at the belt, you will hit the target. So instead of trying to teach the soldiers, uh, for example, at, at uh, the target at 100, they need to aim off by 56 centimeters or uh, 31 centimeters if the target is 175 meters. Um, that, that's too complicated and you're not going to be able to estimate that properly anyway. So just aim for the belt and you will hit a soldier somewhere. Keep it simple, conscript army, remember. Now, when it comes to shooting at 400 and 600 meters, things get a little bit more interesting because there, of course, you're going to have to aim off. Uh, now, I will say that 400 meters and beyond, they are explicitly instructed not to try and hit individual targets. So you really are looking for sort of area suppression a sort of volley fire at that stage. So um, if we look at the ballistic curve, in theory, if I want to uh, hit a man at 400 meters, I have to aim eight meters above belt height. And if I'm aiming at a target at 600 meters, I have to aim 27 meters above belt height. Uh, so how are we gonna do that with the fixed sight? Time for another little demonstration. When firing at 400 meters, the thumb is wrapped over the top of the rear barrel band and you aim using the top of the knuckle. When firing at 600, the thumb is in an open position. 
with the joint approximately five millimeters above the top of the barrel band and you use the top of the fingernail. The uh, thumb is raised approximately the height of the cardboard tube that's used for containing the powder. You what? You're having a laugh mate. I think indeed if I listen very carefully I can probably still hear the high school of musketry across the channel sniggering 170 years ago. Yeah, uh, what's even funnier is that the instructions explicitly state that the, uh, the officers should be mindful of the uh, anatomy of their soldiers' thumbs, because someone might have a short thumb or a long thumb or, uh, you know, the joints might be in a slightly different place. And yes, so you will need to adjust uh, to instruct each individual soldier to place his thumb in jack, just so, depending on their anatomy. Uh, very curious indeed, especially when you consider whether that uh, they were fully prepared to have rifles with adjustable sights for the entire infantry and they even have provisional instructions ready uh, before the minier appeared. So it's not as if they were unwilling or had no clue about training soldiers to use adjustable sights. Um, it just wasn't to be for some reason. And um, if we take a step back to the uh, smoothbore muskets, the percussion ones, there the effective range was judged, or was trained up to 300 meters. And to aim off at 300 meters, it was uh, four meters 70. And all they did for that was that they placed a secondary target, a reference target, four meters 70 above the target you intended to hit. And um, you just trained that way in this effectively the soldiers through muscle memory remembered, I need to be, you know, I need to have the muzzle at this inclination to shoot at that distance. So the, uh, yeah, the, the combination of the rifling and the minier effectively doubles the range of the infantry musket. And uh, for some reason it wasn't exploited. Uh, they continued to have have sort of precision shooting up to 200 meters and anything above that was using this silly sort of volley parabolic flight only on mass targets or artillery positions and such. And since I mentioned the artillery, I would not be at all surprised if in the minutes of the discussion about the introduction of rifled muskets, there are some very, very strong objections from the artillery commission. They were an extremely powerful lobby in France. Um, basically putting their foot down and having nothing, wanting nothing to do with the introduction of this newfangled uh, technology which might encroach on their glorious role on the battlefield. So uh, I think politics will probably played an important role in this. Anyway, back to the main subject. In terms of the actual amount of shooting, they have three sessions at 100, three sessions at 200, and then two sessions respectively at 400 and 600, which gives a grand total of 60 cartridges. The soldiers are also categorized in uh, terms of proficiency, and this was corresponding to the number of hits on the target. So it's literally the number of hits on this two meter by half a meter wide target. It doesn't matter where they are as long as they're hits. So there would be a first sorting uh, once they'd done the shooting at 100 and 200, and then they would be rearranged depending on the results at 400 and 600. So uh, you would be a first class soldier in terms of accuracy if you put at least 20 out of 60 on the target, second class if you put between 15 and 19 hits on target, and third class if you hit uh, 14 or under out of 60 on the target. Now the grading of the soldiers was simply a means for the officers to identify who were the good soldiers and also to you know, promote a little bit of uh, esprit de corps, as it were. Um, now, supplemental to this, there was also further competitions to uh, marksman competitions that would take the first class shooters uh, from the infantry, but also the officers. They also had uh, their own uh, shooting competition separate from the common folk, of course. Uh, but this, that's a little bit another subject. Uh, when, it when it comes to actual practice and shooting, um, all the, the grades were mixed together. It wasn't just the first class shooting together, second class, third class. However, um, those who were ranked in the second and third class did have to go through some remedial actions to work on the, uh, the fundamentals, if time allowed, of course. Now, supplemental to this purely target shooting, there was also uh, training and shooting in open order and shooting while moving. And for this, there were two sessions that were planned uh, of 10 
cartridges each. In the first exercise, the targets are placed somewhere between 200 and 250 meters, and the men start from a firing line, and they have five cartridges which they have to load and shoot on the move before they reach 150 meters distance away from the target. They then have to do a rearguard action and shoot the remaining five while retreating. Uh, at, for this exercise, the, the exact distance is not known, also not known to the officers, so they really have to estimate. So it could be that they completely underestimate or overestimate the range and completely miss. In the uh, second variation of this exercise, we are now shooting at a target which is 300 to 600 meters. It's now a group of eight targets together, so you're, you're shooting at a, a massed troops. And this time the distance is known to the officers. If uh, the officers are in charge of new recruits, they are allowed to say, to, to instruct the soldiers and adjust their firing uh, accordingly. If they are experienced soldiers, this distance is kept a secret and the soldiers have to estimate that on their own. Now, supplemental to these exercises in individual marksmanship, there is also an exercise in platoon firing and also firing in two ranks. Um, for each of these exercises, there's one session at 200 meters with uh, three cartridges in platoon, six in rank fire, and a second one at 400 meters, also three cartridges for platoon and six cartridges for two rank fire. Uh, I won't go into detail about those. Um, that's a, a different ball game, but uh, by all means, dig into this document if you're really interested. So in summary, be it the young recruits or the old hand coming in for his yearly uh, repetition, would go through the basics and then they would fire a total of 98 live rounds a year. Uh, this, for the most part, up to 200 meters and the accuracy requirements are essentially a minute of man. Now, this is vastly different to the uh, British way uh, of, of training the riflemen where yeah, every, every single soldier is expected to be a rifleman and there's a figure of merit and all sorts. Um, and it's interesting that historically in the conflicts of the period um, that doesn't seem to be really a, a superior method and the, the two didn't really clash directly so you could get you know, a measure of which one was better. So um, here we are at the end of uh, this little introduction into the, uh, the uh, instruction for shooting of the average French soldier at the time. Uh, of course, back in the day, as is still the case, shooting is actually a very small part of uh, the soldierly life. There are far more other skills that they also had to learn. So you had to balance the time taken to train them in shooting and training and all the other functions they had to do. So um, here we are at the end of the episode. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, of course, for all your support, whatever platform you wish to follow us on. And I uh, hope to see you next time, maybe here in the workshop or out there on the range. Bye.